try to get started now. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you uh, all to celebrate the launch of Women Creating Change. And I'm uh, Professor Laila Abulogod, and I teach anthropology and gender studies here at Columbia. And I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Social Difference. And almost uh, five years ago now, uh, the center, uh, almost five years old now, uh, the Center um, for the Study of Social Difference is an advanced study center whose mission is to encourage and support innovative research and intellectual exchange among Columbia and Barnard faculty, uh, students, and our colleagues around the world who believe that we must understand better the forms of social inequality we live with and use our knowledge to imagine different futures. And we've supported long-term interdisciplinary uh, working groups based in the arts and sciences, but widely inclusive, who meet intensively both here uh, at Columbia and in sites around the world to analyze the many ways that the social categories of gender, race, ethnicity, disability, uh, um, and sexuality shape experiences and structure our worlds. And Women Creating Change is our exciting new initiative. Uh, it's meant to mobilize feminist scholars and other talented individuals from across Colombia's many schools and connect them to scholars, artists, and activists in different regions of the world uh, for a purpose, to define the pressing problems affecting women globally and to explore the creative roles women are playing in addressing those problems. Inspired by President Bollinger's uh, commitments, and we're Glad that uh, Jean Maniano Bollinger uh, is here with us today, supported by so many across the university, and we wanted to point out uh, Safwan Masri in particular, the director of, the, of Columbia's Global Centers. And uh, given form and direction uh, by uh, my visionary colleagues, I have to say, uh, Professor Jean Howard and Mariana Hirsch, uh, this global initiative is being celebrated today I think very appropriately by featuring uh, Abigail Disney's documentary work. Now, Columbia's eight global centers have opened up new possibilities for deepening the kind of international in, uh, collaborations and exchange of insights and research that lie at the heart of women creating change. And I've just returned, for example, from uh, our global center in Paris, where our working group on gender, religion, and law in the Muslim world met for three days of very spirited uh, conversation and intellectual exchange. 19 scholars and activists from Morocco to South Africa, Iraq to India, Turkey to Belgium, came together to share their research and to debate the promises and also the potential pitfalls of some creative new forms of Muslim women's activism. Islamic feminism is real, uh, we realized. Uh, but it works differently in various regions and political contexts among the tense racial politics in Europe, for example, or with the disappointments in North Africa about the Arab uprisings in settings like India and Iraq that are uh, inflamed by communal conflict or in cosmopolitan gatherings in capital, the capital of Malaysia where experts push for experiments in global legal reform. Other colleagues have just returned from Mumbai, uh, where our Global Center facilitated the first phase of an ambitious comparative project to explore how um, accelerated urbanization in the Global South has affected the life worlds of the poor and disenfranchised, especially those who suffer gen gendered vulnerability. Uh, and this working group on the gender in the global slum will expand the South Asian network uh, to ask how the spatial logics of segregation, exclusion, and displacement set off social conflicts, uh, but also give rise to utopian imaginations uh, elsewhere. And they, they're going to continue to meet both at, uh, here in New York, uh, in Mumbai, but also in South Africa, Shanghai, and Rio, getting different networks along the way. And what we think a world-class university uh, can offer is a space for what we like to think of as slow thought. On the model of slow food, um, not slow, uh, our initiative is about creating uh, the conditions 
in which scholars, filmmakers, activists, lawyers, NGO uh, activists, policy makers can carefully prepare research, do fresh thinking together, and savor the complexity of what we must do and understand if we hope to understand um, and address social problems responsibly, res responsibly. And I think with our new global centers, the space for slow thought has become multi-local. Now as power and resources become more unequally distributed among nations and social groups, women across the globe face particular forms of vulnerability. These include the burden of representing their religious or ethnic communities, challenges in accessing jobs, healthcare, education, reproductive choices, marginality in fragile slum economies, and insecurity caused by the violence of war and political terror. And women have responded to these conditions with innovative forms of activism uh, and innovative forms of life. Um, and Women Creating Change is committed to learning about these and learning from them. Now it's a pleasure for me to turn over the floor uh, to Ann Kaplan, a Columbia University trustee and an alumna whose unwavering support for our center's academic mission has been vital. Um, uh, she's a partner of Circle Wealth Management, uh, but her commitment to women creating change has taken many forms, including her service on the board of the Women's Forum and her advisory work with the Council on Foreign Relations Initiative on Women and Foreign Policy. And Anne uh, will introduce uh, Dr. Abigail Disney and the program. Uh, and what we'll be doing is screening a short segment of a brilliant film. Uh, and after we've seen that, Professors Jean Howard, Director of Women Creating Change, and Saidia Hartman, the Director of the, our uh, Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, which is incidentally celebrating its 25th year uh, anniversary this year. Uh, I don't know how many of you were here then. Uh, we'll, uh, they'll open up a discussion with her and the audience about her own creative political work as well as that of the women she's featured in her films. So please, please join me in welcoming and publicly thanking Anne Kaplan. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Tonight represents three of my favorite things, Columbia, women, and global initiatives, and I get to introduce my friend, Abby Disney, so how great is that? Um, and I'm so pleased to see so many people here. There are a few men, but I'm so pleased to see so many women because when this many women get in a room together, the positive energy results in something good happening. So I'll be watching for what that is tonight. Well, we all know the positive impact on our global society that education, economic empowerment, and social justice for women have. Now thanks to Lee Bollinger's vision, with a little help from Jean. Where's Jean? There. <laughs> um, we now have the ability to sustain a research initiative that allows our very important global feminist scholars to come together to coordinate their research. And it's very exciting that it's done on a global basis. As Lila mentioned, we now have eight global centers, and Safwan Masri is here, who coordinates, runs, and provides the moral and enthusiastic leadership for those centers. Um, and those centers allow us to sponsor the research within a setting so that academicians can coordinate with each other and so that the research is truly global. I'm very proud to personally support Women Creating Change, and I hope you'll join me in providing resources to ensure the sustainability of the program. And now I am delighted to introduce Abby Disney. Abby is a model for the mission of Women Creating Change. She's an activist, feminist, impact investor, and global thought leader. All of these characteristics are embedded in her incredible films. And she is also a Columbian. 
She has a PhD from Columbia. Her husband went to Columbia, and they were married in the chapel on the Columbia University campus. <laughs> Abby has produced numerous films that highlight social, political, and psychological issues which impact women. I just was at Sundance, where, by the way, Donna McPhee, where is she? hosted an incredible event for the Columbia community at Sundance. I think there were 600 people there. And, but I was fortunate enough at Sundance to see some of Abby's new impactful films, which I recommend to all of you that you see when they come out, hopefully, in the movie theaters. An important example of her work was the public television series called Women, War, and Peace. The four-part series is brilliant, and you should really get it on Netflix or go on to the public television station where I think you can also find it. But what so impressed me was the innovative way in which Abby created an outreach program so that the film could be seen by the maximum number of people. The film we'll see today is Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which she made following a trip in 2006 to Liberia. The film won the 2008 Tribeca Film Festival Award for the Best Documentary, and we're fortunate to not only see the film, but also to be able to hear Abby speak about it. So Abby, we are honored to have you here today to celebrate our new initiative. You exemplify the creativity, moral commitment to justice, social purpose, and respect for careful research and analysis that we seek to embody, so thank you. Thank you, wonderful Anne, and you should know she's also a woman creating a lot of change and breaking barriers down in the business world for women, both on the investing and on the business side of it. And to Jean, who I think has her signature on my PhD, even though we hadn't ever met before um, the other day, so that's kind of exciting to me. Um, I uh, came here a really long time ago to Columbia, 1984 I came here, oh God. Um, that was a long time ago. Uh, to start a PhD program, and, I, and I, um, I got to work, and I did my coursework, and then I kind of followed, you know, my heart uh, to, the, to the area of interest that, that uh, drew me. And the idea of me getting a PhD was really rooted, actually, in, in believe it or not, um, the interest I had in making the world a better place. And it's not usually, PhD programs aren't usually where you go if that's your impulse. They feel sort of dry, they feel sort of um, ivory tower-ish, but in fact, my life had really been changed when I went to my undergraduate school at Yale, and um, I was just a, a really a dumb little valley girl who said, oh my God, a lot. And um, <laughs> I got to Yale, and I picked up a few books, and I had a few magical professors, and I was completely altered. Altered, altered, altered forever in every fundamental way you can be altered. And I came here to get a PhD because I wanted to be that person for other people. I wanted to be somebody who lit people up the way I was lit up. And that was really the beginning of my journey. Um, but of course, you follow the stream and you, you, know, you get deeper and deeper into your work and it gets a little drier and drier and that's a little bit what happened to me. I started, um, I started to suffocate a bit on, on just the books. Um, so I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be back in this place where I spent a lot of my years and a lot of my energy and my heart. And as you know, I was married here and um, formed a lot of friendships and formed a lot of my adult way of thinking about the world because of the way it marries research, academia, um, with activism. Because I think what, what happened was I was an activist in my heart and as long as I was a scholar only and not an activist, I started to suffocate a little bit. But when I left Columbia and finished my PhD and I had had a couple of kids along the way and was having a few more along the way, I have four, um, I started being more of an activist and less of a scholar. And I started to suffocate there too. Um, so I spent a lot of years going on the boards of organizations and sort of exploring the neighborhoods and finding out who was doing good, interesting work. And uh, it led me to this group called the New York Women's Foundation. Um, some of us know it well. 
And the New York Women's Foundation was very interesting because it took people who were actually in the communities and put them together with the ladies with the big fat checkbooks and everybody came together in a room and they made their decisions together, shoulder to shoulder, which was revolutionary to me. Um, and you went out into the neighborhoods and what you discovered was Red Hook is not a depressing place, or, and believe me, when I say Red Hook, the picture in 1986, Red Hook, wow. Um, but it's not a depressing place because it turns out it's populated by these extraordinary people who are pulling together neighborhood associations and talking about changing the world in very real terms. They're not waiting for somebody to come and help them out. They're doing the work of it right now. And I, I kind of think of that moment in my life as my Dorothy moment, because I think I was living in black and white, and then I opened the door and came out into Munchkin land. And you remember that moment when they're, they're all under the pots, the flower pots? It turns out they were there all along. That's how New York altered for me when I put my focus on the activist women, particularly in neighborhoods. Um, but again, I spent a lot of years doing that work. Um, I learned as much as I could learn. My son, my youngest, got into kindergarten and I felt like the leash was maybe a little longer, I could go a little further. So I started doing the similar kind of work for the Global Fund for Women, and this meant you know, the same sort of neighborhood-based grassroots organizations, only these are in Rabat, and in, their, in Karachi, and they're in Malaysia, and they're in Sudan, and so forth. Um, and that was an extraordinary uh, aha for me, because what I discovered was they were the exact same women. They were having the exact same conversation with the same ethos and the same vocabulary. I swear to God, they made the same jokes. They started every meeting with a loaf of bread or something to eat of some kind. And this extraordinary commonality from place to place to place was a revelation to me. But it wasn't until 2006 when I went to Liberia. And I met, again, another group of these extraordinary, amazing women who, unless you had the eyes to see them, you would never have noticed, right? And I had spent these years honing my eyes now to notice and pay attention to these invisible women who were doing this work on the ground. And, and there I heard this incredible story. And the story is that they're in Liberia, there's years and years of civil war, horrible dictator, and the Muslim women and the Christian women come together and they work out their differences, they learn each other's prayers, they show up on an airfield by the side of the road every day for three years. They take off all the jewelry and all the markers of class that separate them from each other. They wear a simple white t-shirt and a simple piece of fabric and they stand there by the side of the road praying and fasting and demanding a meeting with the president of Liberia. Who had, by the way, said to them, if my own mother comes out and demonstrates, I will kill her. So facing down the threat on their lives every single day, they went out there and forced a meeting with Charles Taylor, the dictator, forced him to consent to go to the peace talks in Ghana, went to Sierra Leone and met with the rebels, got them to go to the peace talks in Ghana, and then followed everybody to Ghana and sat outside the peace talks in a white t-shirt and a simple piece of fabric, no jewelry, no makeup, no hairstyle, prayers, singing, fasting. And when those peace talks broke down, they finally kind of cracked and they sent a note inside, they surrounded the building, they locked arms and they said, we're taking you all hostage for the women of Liberia. It's an incredible moment. So I heard this story um, when I was there in 2006, it had happened in 2003, and I, I had this sensation. Um, I couldn't figure out what it was until I got home and a couple weeks later, and what I realized it was was rage. I was really mad. I read the newspaper, I pay attention to things. Why did I not already know this story? And, you know, it is where, frankly, the activist in me is certainly fueled by rage, <laughs> but it came together with what I know from being a scholar, which is the news is the first crack at history. And if they didn't make it to CNN, and if they didn't make it to the New York Times, they weren't going to make it into the books, they weren't going to make it into the scholarship, and they were going to disappear. 
And that's what I realized was, you know, from all of that I had read and seen and understood about women's histories through the e years, and I understood in an intellectual that things disappear. And I realized that this story that I had threaded together with the little bits and pieces that I had heard on that first trip to Liberia, and it felt a little bit like a, a jigsaw puzzle without all the pieces. I could get little bits and pieces, but not the whole thing. I thought, this me must be what it looks like before something disappears, that kind of evanescence, that f slipping through your fingers feeling. And that's when I realized that I had the capacity. I was uniquely placed on this planet. I was in a position to take something on the edge like that and pull it back and prevent it from disappearing under the waves. And that was the very conscious decision that we made when we started Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And, and the process of making the film was always very informed by the idea that well, we were going to take these people who were defined out of mattering. They were defined out of having a historical relevance and we were going to simply assert them into the historical record. It is why we used, for instance, we shot in HD. It's why when we interviewed the women, we made them up to look beautiful, we had beautiful backgrounds. It's why we chose one of the best editors in the business to do it. It's why we had a beautiful composition by a very talented um, musical composer. We knew the more we dressed it up to look like something that mattered, something that was expensive, something that people who had clout had spent some time on, the more people would believe <laughs> what we were asserting, which does that it was historical. And, and, if, and if you doubt the way things disappear, I will just tell you that in that central moment when there's a confrontation at the peace talks, so Lema, the leader of the women says, we're taking you all hostage for the women of Liberia. They send security out to arrest her. And she said, they, were, they said they were arresting me for obstructing justice. And she said, that was just more than I could take. Something snapped. And she said, if you want to arrest me, I'll make it very easy to arrest me. And she started to strip naked. Beautiful. Um, and by the way, lest you think it's only in Africa that that's a big deal, just try to picture Dick Cheney's mother stripping naked somewhere. <laughs> it matters to all of us, right? It matters a lot. Um, and uh, so, as I was putting this story back together and I was finding people who were there and I was asking them about it, there was a guy in Liberia that I asked about it. He was a British guy, a little too much scotch. <laughs> so I got the whole story out of him. Um, he said to me, yes, yes, those women, they were really important. They really changed the course of history. We wouldn't be sitting here in peace without them. And in fact, there's CNN footage of me climbing out a window. That's what he said to me. That was the moment when my inner producer clicked on and I thought, archival footage. So the first thing when we started producing the film that we did was to go and look and go to CNN and go to BBC and go to Sky News for the archival footage. We know there were um, photographers there shooting the events of that talk. They were there that day because Lema went and talked to them before she organized this action. And we edited it around a black hole at the center of the film for almost nine months. And the fact is we scoured every which way from Sunday through their archives. They didn't shoot it. Women take the peace talks hostage with a former president of Nigeria, six warlords in the room, officials from the United Nations and around the world, and they're not shooting. And the only way that we were able to get that footage was from one NGO that was in the area that had, they knew they had a videotape, they couldn't find it. We had them search their offices for nine months. And one day someone in a meeting said, well, what's holding up that broken window over there? And it had been getting rained on, and the sun had been shining on it all of that time. And I mean, literally erasure. You know, the word erasure is the one that you use when you describe the way women don't make it into the record or get expunged from the record. Literally the only usable piece of about 60 seconds in that tape was what we used in the film, because the rest of it had been destroyed by the sun and the rain. So that's what I mean when I say that we're expunged. It may be a kind of benign prejudice, it may be malign, I can't really decide, but it was very important to take at least one of these episodes. And the reason I knew that was important was because of what I knew of the women that I encountered around the world and the way they operate on stories. 
and the way these stories matter to them. And I knew that over and over again, if, if they didn't know the example of these women, they would be doing what they were doing as though for the first time, over and over and over again. And that's what women have been doing. And if they could just have one example of something lifted up for them, what might it unlock in them to be able to do? So that leads to the extraordinary life of this film, because the film has a story of how it got made. It has a story of, of, of what is actually in the film. But it also has this incredible story since its birth in 2008. Our first audience ever was in Srebrenica in Bosnia, which is so strange to say, right? I mean, that seems like, why would you do that? But I had been there um, on a, another trip on an unrelated matter. I had described what the women in Liberia had done. I told them I was making a film, and the ladies in Srebrenica said, we are your first audience, you have to bring the film back. So on International Women's Day in 2008, I'm sitting in the town hall in Srebrenica. And for those of you who don't remember what happened there, um, the, in 1994, the um, Bosnian Serbs overran a UN enclave that was a protectorate and slaughtered about 8,000 Muslim men and boys in front of their wives and daughters and sisters. And um, it's w one of the worst genocidal acts in that war. And those women have basically moved back to Srebrenica and they are waiting. They are waiting for DNA evidence, evidence, some kind of anything they can bury that belongs to their husbands. These are some tough ladies but they've been traumatized. So at their request, I went back, I showed them the film. And what's interesting is that the two hours that happened after that film proceeded exactly in the same way that it has proceeded since then in the other 31 countries that I've taken it to personally, the other 40 plus countries that it's gone to without me. Um, and, and that is like this, the film ends, the ladies are really, really mad. They're pissed off. Why did you bring this film here to make me upset on International Women's Day? That lasts about 10 minutes. And then there's about 10 minutes where they say, you know, there was that lady and she was exactly like my sister. I recognize that woman. Now, I was surprised by that because Eastern Europe is sometimes a little bit closed-minded around race. I was expecting some hesitancy around race, around the religion, I was expecting hesitancy around culture and class and all kinds of things. There was none of it, not a shred. These women recognized themselves all over these women in the film. They saw themselves completely unfiltered through any of those obstacles that we would have thought would be in their way. So that goes for about 10 minutes. You could set your watch by this, I swear to God. 20 minutes in, there's always a woman. She always stands up. She always pushes her sleeves up when she says it. <laughs> And she says, that's what they did over there. What are we going to do here today? What are we going to do here today about this mayor and this town hall and the butcher down the street and the plumbing and the fact that we're still a UN protectorate and how are we going to deal with these three corrupt presidents and on and on and on and it's extraordinary. And what proceeded over and over again at these screenings was an unbelievable outpouring of a desire to be engaged, a desire to think of themselves as political actors in a way that, in fact, they hadn't really before. And I'm convinced to go back to, I mean, weirdly, my dissertation, I didn't know why I was writing it at the time I was writing it, was on war novels. Um, and one of the most interesting things about war novels is they just are absent women, almost completely. You'll see women in there, but they're basically prostitutes, their mothers waving goodbye, sometimes they're nurses, but they're objects, they're never subjects. You know, they have been written out as effective agents of anything from these landscapes, not only in the novels. Go back to the Iliad, you'll find it there too. Go, go to any Sylvester Stallone movie, it's all over those films. We have written women out of these landscapes, even though they are in there, they're in the language. If you can fight house to house, if you can rape and pillage your way across a landscape, they are in there, right? And this was an image of women in wartime as subjects, not objects. And I'm convinced that that is the unlocking. That is the thing that triggers this activity that comes after it. But I felt repeatedly like 
um, something really extraordinary, some bonfire was getting started. But I also kind of knew how poorly resourced these women were, how poorly networked they were, how seldom they gathered, how they didn't have a habit of gathering. And so that was when the idea for Women, War, and Peace came. I felt like I was just had the one match, and I was trying to light a great big fire. But if we had five films, if we came back and they gathered once a week for five weeks or once a month for five months, maybe that was enough to get the brush fire started, to get some momentum, to get the habit of gathering, to get the habit of seeing yourself as a subject, not an object, in a conflict situation. And that was essentially why we made Women, War, and Peace. So I'm going to leave you with that story, and I'm going to let you watch this excerpt from Pray the Devil Back to Hell, um, which came out in 2008, was sort of the moving force. And then we'll come back and talk some more about it. Thank you. Money, greed, ethnicity, absolute power. There is nothing that should make people do what they did to the children of Liberia. The warlords gave these boys guns and sent them off. They just do anything because they had guns. You go to bed saying, God, please. What do we do? I had a dream, and it was like a crazy dream. We decided to protest. We wore the white, saying to people we were out for peace. Thousands of women, Muslim and Christian, were coming together, calling for peace. These women had seen the worst, but they still had that vibrance for life. And we said, well, if I should get killed, just remember me that I was fighting for peace. We stepped out first and did the unimaginable. To send out a signal to the world that we, the Liberian women, we are tired of the killing of our people. We can do it again if we want to. I want to hear now, gratefully acknowledge the powerful voice of women. Marianne Hirsch, the Center for the Project on Women Creating Change. And this is Saidia Hartman, who's head of our um, Institute on Research on Women and Gender. And we're going to start off the conversation with a couple of questions, and then we'll quite quickly turn to the audience, because I know you must have a lot of questions, too. So sh shall I start? Sure. OK. Abby, I wondered about how you worked with these women, because this is something that happened in the past. You're yeah. reconstructing it. You're obviously getting footage. What are you filming new at this moment? Mm. And how much are the women involved participants in making this film? How did you right. work, literally right. work with them? That, that was delicate. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was delicate, because there were so many women in the movement, um, and there were definitely strong feelings about who should be on screen and who shouldn't be on screen. So we had to be. We had to tread really lightly. Um, everybody in Liberia wanted to help us make this film. Everybody we talked to. I mean, there was, at one point, we were out shooting um, in, in the graveyard, which is just a really devastating thing to see. And it was magic hour. The sun was setting. You kind of lose track of time. And there were some rather menacing looking characters kind of closing in on us. We told them what we were making the film about. And they were like, oh, the women are white. What can we do for you? What can we do for you? It was kind mm -hmm. of that sort of thing. We shot. We took them out to the field and we shot them out there. Um, and in fact, because I think we were showing a DVD, and I apologize for the resolution of that, it should have been a better quality um, way that we showed it to you. But you could really see dramatically the difference in the quality of some of the footage. You can mm -hmm. see some of that footage was terrible and some of it was gorgeous. So you know, what was gorgeous was either shot by a news source or us. 
But the stuff that was terrible was stuff that we um, really were scrappy about finding. We, mm -hmm. we had about four or five different private individuals who were themselves out with little cheap um, VHS cameras shooting video. So the, the putting the story together was very complex because we had some archival footage, some private footage, and then we wove it together with what we ourselves had generated to kind of recreate the feeling of them gathering when they're hugging on the field. That's all very genuine. They hadn't seen each other in a long time, and so the feelings of when they're dancing on the field, I see. that all was, we, we asked them to just show us what they did. I see. So, so a good part of this was new footage that mm -hmm. you actually shot. Yeah. And of course, the interviews. And did you find that these women were very canny now about like Western media and interested in how they were going to get more attention for their activities you know, and this history? When we first approached Lema, and I didn't find out about who Lema was, the leader of the movement, uh -huh. until we'd been researching actually for a while. And then her name came up. And then we met with her. And she thought we were just a ridiculous couple of white girls. She just had no patience for us. She couldn't believe she was wasting her time on us at all. And um, she, she just really, she had kind of gotten used to people coming, asking her about it, and then going away and nothing happening. She had no expectation that anybody would ever care about this. So um, that was actually kind of good because then we didn't get people trying to kind of steer the story and we were able to really control it and follow the direction that it seemed to need to go in. So in 2003, when this was first happening, these women w did not have an eye on the international news media. They had an eye totally on the immediate well, situation. The international news media was didn't care looking, about them. And they couldn't They get really couldn't have cared less. When, when Lema confronts Charles Taylor in mm -hmm. that scene, you see that w sea of white t-shirts, mm -hmm. there was not one single news source there. Not one. Even our source for archival footage, who was pretty reliable and had a lot of combat footage, he wasn't there for that because there was no combat. He can't sell that back here to news sources in the United States. Mm -hmm. So they don't shoot what they can't sell. And gotcha. they can't sell anything that isn't blood. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I had a question, and thank you for that. And that is, you know, you're working in all of these. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? There, you're, yeah, okay. you're on. Um, you're working in all these different locales, and how is your notion of feminism transformed or challenged by the process of working in all of these places? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, because um, I think American women have a tendency to go over to other places like a ton of bricks, like we invented feminism, mm -hmm. and we know how it's done, and they need to just be quiet and listen to our wisdom. And uh, actually, my best moment for really being humbled was from a Moroccan woman who said to me, I, you know, you need to shut up about the hijab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know why you think it have it so good, because I've seen what your television looks like. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any friends with anorexia, and people don't catcall me when I walk down the street. So maybe, just maybe, the hijab isn't the problem. Um, <laughs> That's a very powerful thing to hear. And, and so what I've learned in, in the years that I've been traveling and, and speaking to women activists around the world is that we need to start learning. Um, th th there's this impression, especially when you're in the development world, in the philanthropy world, everybody thinks that the intellectual capital is originated here and it flows out. <laughs> and, and if we could just shut up long enough to let the intellectual capital flow this way, there's an enormous amount of change that we would benefit from. Yeah, and was there like one particular challenge besides, you know, being a Yankee imperialist and maybe being in terms of dealing with Liberian women? That's no small challenge. Yeah, you know, it's a hard one. And right I mean, so, suspicion. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. suspicion is a hard one. And um, finding the footage was really probably the most central challenge. Although women are a little bit like a mafia. they Once they start talking to each other, things that start unlocking for you that might not have unlocked for somebody else. Um, the, the challenge was, you know, you really couldn't get anything done unless you were actually physically there. So telephone calls and emails get nothing done. You have to go there, you have to be there, and you have to talk to people. And they don't trust you unless you show up, which I think is reasonable. Um, and then the, the other challenge was editing the film, which was a very complex process because you had five narrators and one story um, and we had, and we just interviewed them. We didn't script them. We didn't ask them to say anything. So we just took what they told us and wove it together into a single unified narrative, which was an incredibly difficult process. 
And I had a, just a follow-up question, and that was at one point Lima says something like, you know, we, in some sense, we were forced to speak the language of peace because to make a more directed political critique would have, you know, invited government reprisal. What would the mm. context of that larger critique have yeah. been? Well, the, actually, you, you see it in, um, Lema and I have talked about this for a long time. We were sort of waiting for the moment when somebody was going to get, emulate the women in white and get shot. And it happened last year in the Ivory Coast. I don't know if you saw, there was an episode where um, a group of women were protesting for peace and, and the government came out and shot seven of them brutally, terribly. It was a really horrible moment. And we had sent the film there. Lehman had worked with those women. So we knew they were working from Pray the Devil Back to Hell. But their mistake was they weren't being above politics. And, and that's what Lehman is saying is, is like, we can work out the particulars. You just need to stop shooting us. That was all she had to say. And actually, when I think about it, it's radically conservative what, what they were asking. Because when they went to the peace talks, all they said was, work the process. Do this in good faith. And we're going to sit out here and make sure that you work the process. They didn't come in with solutions. They just said, represent us. Um, and so that's what she's saying when she says that we just focused on the word peace. Because if she had, had um, allowed herself to be drawn or any of these women into any of the particulars of the politics, they would become parties to the conflict and they would be sullied and unable to maintain this moral, um, there's a particular voice, women can speak in, particularly women that, the age, that are the age of people's mothers. Um, and it's really important that they hold on to that moral high ground. I take it that the um, very coming together of a Christian and a Muslim group was itself mm. a radical political move it was. without saying anything. Right, right. And, and I have to say, you have to give all credit to Lema because she anticipated most of the tactical challenges in advance. And sadly, it's really difficult to edit everything into a film that you want in there. So I wish we could have had more of Lema's strategic um, her, her chess game kind of way of seeing three moves ahead of herself. But she knew that women would be leery of each other because mm -hmm. they had never worked together, which is why she urged them to learn each other's prayers. But what's not in the film is that she persuaded the women to take three days and leave town, the leaders from each of the two groups. And they spent three days together. And in the first day, the Muslim women got to say anything they wanted to about the Christian women. And the Christian women weren't allowed to respond. So on the second day, Christian women about the Muslim women, and then on the third day, they worked it out. Mm -hmm. And Lema was very conscious of the fact that the fact that they were Muslim and Christian working together would be very threatening. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that would happen would be they'd send people in to try to drive them apart. And this was Lema's way of, of forestalling that. And sure enough, it, that's exactly how it played out. They sent people in to divide them, but they had already bonded. It didn't work. I have one more question I want to ask before we open yeah. it, and that's about how you work. So you have gone from Liberia to at least four other sites right. for women, uh, a peace and war. How do you prepare yourself for the complexities mm -hmm. of working in each of these sites? Like, right. do you have academics you consult? How do you go about it yeah. so that you're ready to go in there and confront what you're going to confront? Well, the, the journalists are incredibly great sources, and you talk to two or three or four of the people who've really been embedded and know the situation well. Um, and then you go to the academics, too. And generally, if you read around uh, enough, you'll, you'll figure out who are the voices that you trust. Yes. You know, you, and you, you see on the internet who links to who. And you know, eventually, you suss out. Some people emerge really quickly. Um, Your PhD training, you see yeah, it, here. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, uh, and so w w journalists and academics were, were stop number one. But because of all the work I'd been doing with grassroots women's organizations around the world, I credit that just as much as I credit those kind sure. of more obviously mainstream voices. And so we would reach out to all the NGOs that we could connect with mm -hmm. in the area and get their read on the situation. And in the same kind of way, Pe people start to emerge. People start to separate themselves in the crowd, and you find the two or three or four people that, that are going to be good guides for you. And that's how you find your story, and that's how, and then you just follow that. Gotcha. All right, we should open it up to other people. Are there, are there other questions? Yes. Right there. 
Please stand up and give us your name. Yeah, I'm, I'm Clara Rodriguez. Uh, and my question has to do with your, your filming. Uh, people seem to be, particularly when you were filming the men uh, who were ready to go off to war, uh, and they seem to be, were you in hiding? Were they just okay with it? Well, th that's archival footage because we weren't there for that part of it. That's archival footage. But again, you know, we gathered all the archival footage we could get our hands on, both from the formal news sources as well as from the stringers who just sort of freelance go. And uh, we were drowning in footage of men shooting their guns. <laughs> I mean, there's just no end to it. We had to just stop looking because honestly, we were wondering if we'd lose our minds from it because that's how much of it there was. Yes. Yes, Marianne. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I have a question about memories of activism. I'm always very interested in how memory gets transmitted. And um, so I have, a, it's a two-part question. It has to do with how much do the women, do these women remember or know about um, strategies of women's activism that they in fact echo. So, you know, taking your clothes off in public. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, many other situations in which women have done that um, to, in fact, in, in, in the interests of peace. Um, and, and other kinds of strategies that, that these women used. How much do they know about those and also uh, understanding that behaviors of traditional femininity actually work um, in order to persuade um, and also, what are the memories of these actions in today's younger women in Liberia? Uh, I realize that the story is not known around the world and it is much more so as a result of your film, but internally, um, are these stories being handed down? Um, the women, first of all, were building on what had been a long um, period of women's activism to bring the war to an end before anything we record in the film. And I, and I wish I could make a 20 hour long film and people would actually sit through it. And then I would start with dinosaurs roaming the earth and you know, but sadly you can't. But the, the Sugars, the woman, the older woman with sort of dreadlocks was sort of the leader of a group of women in the 1996 that forced Charles Taylor to um, an election and there was a peace that held somewhat, although it was a terribly violent peace um, after that period. So, and they had done a lot of the same kind of work, but they remembered their mistakes. And, and so the, the work that Lema led was with a lot of advice from Sugars and those women, and it built on what they knew and understood from their previous movements. Lema also had read Martin Luther King, she'd read Mahatma Gandhi, she had read a lot of um, things from, but not, there aren't a lot of women for her to find. So she, but she was very versed in not just the language of nonviolence, but the, the thought, the thinking, and the strategy of nonviolence, which is why that moment when security comes to arrest her and she refuses, and they refuse to arrest her, is really important. Because that is the, that is the core of all nonviolent resistance, is the moment when power inverts. And she understood that very well. Um, she was also very aware of the Nigerian women in the Niger, Niger Delta who a few years before had taken um, one of the oil rigs um, hostage and <laughs> many of them had stripped naked and there are actually a whole series of stories going back to the 1920s in resistance to the British colonial powers there. Um, there's one incredibly awful story about the British shooting a whole group of about 100 women down um, because they stripped naked. So, um, so there, there are stories, but these are, as you say, these are the things that are in memory. They're oral histories. They're handed down. They have the, they have the quality of rumor, you know, so that you can't really know. You can't really know. Did this happen? Didn't this happen? Is it a fairy story? Am I just getting some kind of idealistic thing? Am I, you know, it, it, when you're actually doing this stuff, you'd like to know. Did this work? Didn't it work? Am I just being crazy? And um, that's why it was so important to get this down and to, and to fact check the daylights out of it, by the way, because I also knew if there was a tiny chink in the armor, you know, somebody would shoot this movie down. And so we need to know that it was totally unassailable from a fact point of view. In terms of the girls, um, the young women in Liberia, you know, that's Lema's constituency in Liberia. She won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, which 
is so much better than an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I just would never, yeah. Oh. Um, and um, she is, the, those girls, you know, she's changed the way they think of themselves. There are genies that cannot be put back in bottles now, all of, not just in Liberia, but, and not just in Africa. We were just in Sri Lanka in August together, and I wish you could see the way Sri Lankan women greet Lema, what she means, yeah, to those women. So, so there's, um, and, and it's really important because the, the Nobel Committee, um, they have a kind of point of view about the way the world changes that's very political. They think of the world as changing because politicians change it. And, and we, I, I, I had a bit of a debate with them about it, you know, because they didn't really credit Lema. Um, they were like, they said, what they said to us was, um, you know, arguably doesn't Ellen Sirleaf do more for peace in the long run as a politician who runs a good country? And you know, I would never say that's incorrect, but I would also say that unless change comes from the ground up, um, nothing ever changes. You know, change does not get sprinkled from the clouds above you. And, um, and so it was a really, that was a powerful Nobel that they gave it to both of them because that, in fact, actually that's how the world changes. There's a question right up there. Abby, yes. I'm Barbara Paz, Hi. Thank you so much for your work and what you did with the Sangha in Sri Lanka. So here we are. Women really care. We have some power. What do we do to build on your foundation and take this around the world? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, well, we've taken the five, in, in the short term, I'll give you a short term answer and a long term answer. Um, the short term answer is in terms of women, war, and peace. I mean, I really do believe we have an interesting, powerful tool um, that is just the beginning of a tool, but it's really important. I think of it as, you know how it, here in the United States and everywhere in the world, women don't self-identify for power. You know, they don't look in the mirror and they say, and say I look like a president today. Um, <laughs> And, and, they, and they, generally speaking, need to be invited. They, they generally don't feel comfortable stepping into power unless somebody asks them to do it. Um, and so I consider this their engraved invitation. So it's, it's five films in a box. We've dubbed it into French, Spanish, and Arabic. Dubbed, not subtitled, for illiterate populations with discussion guide that's focused on organizing. Because every one of these films leaves you, um, leaves that group wanting to have a conversation about what happens today in my town today. So um, we're trying to move these to um, each one of them is a puppy that needs to have a loving home, you know, because you can't just send something to free for, to somebody. It sits on a shelf and rots. You need people who will love it into all its potential in each of these places. So if you know places where the films belong, good grassroots organizations, not necessarily in conflict settings and not necessarily outside of the United States. There's plenty of conflict in this country and there's plenty of work for women to do. Um, but uh, any help that you can give us around getting those films deployed, that would be really great. Um, in the long term, um, that's, a harder, that's a harder one because, you know, the, there are a million little websites that'll tell you, like, just write me a check, write me a check, write me a check, and it feels so unsatisfying you know, when you're constantly being asked for money. But, you know, come on, let's face it, money is one of the primary things that separates us from, it's not intelligence, it's not a lot of things, it's, it's money. Um, so we need to give more money, we need to make ourselves much more uncomfortable in terms of what we give away. I mean, I love these shoes, I'm not, this doesn't apply to these shoes. <laughs> but, it, but if you will take a pair of shoes and ask yourself what that costs, and then maybe next time don't buy them, you know, and get and give that, you know, or something along those lines. That just just give something that hurts a little more than you do. I, that makes a big difference. That really does change the world. And the other is that um, as women who really are well placed and, and networked and so forth. There's an energy in the international development world right now around women and girls that's wonderful. And I'm 20 years in this space, I've never seen it before. It's really exciting to me. And you've got Nick Kristoff and Half the Sky, and it's all very wonderful. But, 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 girls are easy. Girls are pre-sexual. Girls, you know, don't do the inconvenient things like have sexual desire and unplanned pregnancies. And um, girls are not politically challenging. 
And I do think that to a certain extent, this energy around girls is, is about not frightening anybody and, um, and not taking a more challenging discourse to the public. And the fact is, if we c continue to emphasize girls over rights, we will lose all the ground we gain in the next few years. And the, and the example of that is if you look at India and China, where you know the theory, if you read Nick Kristoff, is if you elevate everybody and er if everybody gets their financial autonomy and moves into the middle class, everyone in the clouds part and the angels sing and everybody lives happily ever after, except what's happening. They're using ultrasounds instead of frozen rivers to kill baby girls. So it's the same gendered violence with a more middle class manifestation. Um, so unless we change the, the, the roots from which this gender discrimination rises, um, it will just take on middle class forms as, ev as everyone theoretically, it doesn't happen that way, but as, 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 as everything rises. So I think we need to be more insistent on more difficult conversations. And when we talk about women, we need to use the word rights. And we need to use the word rights all the time. We need to be edgy, scary, hairy armpit feminists. <laughs> right here. We have, oh, and then we have a question right there next. Okay. Hello, my name is Jacqueline yeah. Spann, and I know Abigail and uh, Lima. Uh, Abigail forgot to mention, I've seen this film, um, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, she didn't show when they actually go to Ghana. That is the biggest part, one of the biggest parts of the film, and how the women challenge, stand up and challenge the authorities and they win. It's just a fantastic scene. But Abigail didn't mention that, first of all, in, in addition to what she just said, that it was her gut instinct to, she went to Li Liberia to cover Ellen Sharif, who is the first African woman president. That's why she went to Liberia. She sees these women with this white on, seated together out on the ground. And she, her, her gut instinct was to find out, what did these people, what are these women doing? She sees all these women. And she asked them, some news reporters, and they said, oh, they're not important, you know. So this really struck her curiosity. She followed her instincts, and she went and researched this and investigated it. And that's how it snowballed. And she and Lima made an instant connection. And I thought it was wonderful how they connected, because they both had so many important resources to connect together. And she's taken this film. When she was at the United Nations, she got a standing ovation. And as stuck up as the people at the United Nations <laughs> are, that was remarkable in itself. Then she took this film to uh, Israel. She's taken it all over the world. But she, you haven't seen the Pray to, to Devil Back to Hell. You've got to see that, too. But all I can do is salute she and Lima, because they made us see the human part of war. They made us connect to the, the, the fear and the tragedy that people have to face that's living right there and, and are you know, helpless. And she showed us that these women knew how to do the political side of it, they knew how to do the religious side. They, they really were resourceful women. So I salute you again and again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Jacqueline. The woman right there. I'm E. Borland's mayor. I don't know that I need this. I was wondering whether there were women who opposed Lima's efforts or your efforts mm -hmm. If so, was it because of tradition or fear? And how was that handled? That's a good question. There were a few women who um, didn't come out onto the fields, didn't support what the women were doing. Generally, they, that's because they had a horse in the race. They were either with Taylor or they were with the other side. There were very few women who didn't support it, though. I mean, that is really the exception. Because by the time 
we get to this point in 2003, the country is just destroyed. You know, well over 50% of the women had been raped in that country. I mean, we're talking about just a really, so they, as Lema always says, their backs were against the wall. Um, Ellen Sirleaf never came out to the field either. Um, she was in and out of the country, sometimes in exile, sometimes not. Um, but she was always a political figure. She always was concerned about her political fortunes, and she, I think she was worried that she would spend her credibility with these kind of unserious looking women um, by going out there with them. So it really wasn't until after. There were 27 candidates in the first round of the first election um, after peace was settled, and Ellen was one of them, along with this very famous soccer player. There was a runoff between the two of them. It wasn't until everybody looked down the barrel of what it would look like under that soccer player as president that all the women got behind Ellen and that Ellen got behind all the women. But it, it took that kind of political necessity because up until that point, they were both sort of holding their noses around each other. We have time for one more question. She's been waiting a long time. Oh, Anne, go on. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Alyssa Canizaro. Um, just this excerpt of the film was amazing, and I can't wait to see more of it and the rest of the Pray films. the devil back to hell.com. Okay. <laughs> um, given the success of these incredibly courageous Liberian women and their peace movement, um, I was wondering what maybe all of you had to think what, is, um, what kind of power do women actually hold in conflict resolution and peacemaking processes around the world? And how can women ensure that that peace is long lasting? That's a really good question. That's the eternal question, right? Well, here's what I'll tell you. I think, having, based on the time I've spent with not just these women, but other women around the world fighting for peace, you know, it's not like there aren't men fighting for peace. And, and I've shown this film at some boys' schools. Um, and it's really interesting because it's a very emotional reaction. And what they ask me very often is, where are the good men in this film? Why are there no good men in this film? Which is a really good question. And I say to them, well, actually, there are good men in this film. They are carrying out the dead, and they're feeding people and taking care of the wounded. The question is, why didn't we see them? Why didn't we notice them? Um, and that comes back to the question of, of roles and expectation um, and, how, and how gender um, skews those things. Um, so we carry it so deeply in us that I also maybe didn't notice those good men until I really gave it some thought. Um, but what, what I do know is that, that the downside is that, right? That we don't see men unless they're expressing some of hyper-masculine, hyper aggressive, form of behavior, um, but there's this gender expectation about women, whether it's in the second X chromosome or the estrogen or the Diet Coke, I don't care <laughs> why it is. I don't care if it's nature or nurture or some combination, I don't care. I do know that in every culture on earth, practically, they are given certain jobs. They are given the job of taking care of the babies and taking care of the sick and the dead and the dying and the food and the education and the water and the housing, this is what women are charged with. And the one necessary precondition to succeeding at those things is peace. You cannot do those things without peace. And so if women have a special relationship to peace, it's rooted in their roles and expectations for themselves and the other women around them. And I do believe in my heart that this is the great untapped potential for women politically going forward. And so that when we move into leadership, we have to bring all of ourselves as women to the job. Like we can't check our femininity at the door, which means that we need to move into leadership positions in mass, in groups, and make those places free for ourselves to really act like women. Um, because without that, you get Margaret Thatcher. And, and that's, you know, um, and, and, and I try to remind people that it's not true for everyone on this earth, if only it were, but in almost every case, a woman's voice is the first voice you hear, right? And it's the first voice that says to you, I love you, I'm going to take care of you, you're going to be all right. 
It's the first voice that says to you, don't hit. You know, share your toys, be nice. It's the first civilizing voice. And in some ways, peace is more a memory than it is something beautiful and distant and imaginary that we're building toward. And I personally think that if we really, really connect these things, the idea of a woman's voice and that first state of peace that we live in, and, and remind ourselves that maybe it's, it's something that we can build back toward to restore, maybe, it, maybe it's that much more attainable for us. I'd like, I'd like to thank... I'd like to thank Abigail Disney very much, and I'd like to welcome all of you to come to a reception, which is downstairs, right? One. No, it's the same level, just exit from here, and take the last one will be right there. Right, so you can pose more questions and have more conversation there. Okay, thank you. Thank you.